So um, I'm really uh, happy and uh, it's an honor to, uh, to introduce you our first uh, keynote this morning. Uh, Dr. Nake uh, is from University of Waterloo. Let me read you a little bit about uh, um, Dr. Nake's VO uh, so that you better understand his work. So um, his work is located within the information and communication technology, design, psychology, human-computer interaction space, but also tied uh, closely into the areas of health, uh, human health and wellness. He uses biotechnology, namely physiological sensors, and much of his research is located in the field of game user research where he's, uh, he's focused on evaluating physiological signals elicited by human when playing games. Dr. Naki has chaired a Kai conference in 2014 uh, on games and entertainment spotlight. Kai conference is one of the biggest uh, international conference in the field uh, and entertain spotlight uh, in the uh, Kai Play 2014 gamification 2013 conferences. His publication has, has won the best paper award at uh, a premier HCI conference. He has more than 100 publications in the field, has been cited a, lo a lot of times. So it's really a great pleasure. Thank you Leonard for coming here. Leonard has been a big inspiration to us. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Salut. Uh, je m'appelle Lena. Um, merci beaucoup. Uh, ça c'est tout que je peux dire par, uh, en français. So uh, <laughs> that's about <laughs> that's about as much French as I can. <laughs> <laughs> as I can leverage. Um, but this is Montreal, so um, it's uh, all fine if I speak in English. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. I'm very excited uh, to be speaking about one of the topics that's really close to my heart, which is games user research, user experience, and flow. So um, what does that mean? Games user research is a, is a huge field, and it has lots of um, different areas um, that you can actually look into. And um, one of the things that we're really interested in, um, in my group, is investigating especially psychophysiological measures. Now, as already said, I'm an associate professor. This is my research group um, at the University of Waterloo. As you can see, there's lots of really happy grad students. We're really um, into gaming, and um, we're really engaged. And, um, we also throw around um, Hello Kitty balls every once in a while. Um, but the, <laughs> the idea behind the lab is, of course, that we want to look into body signals. So we're really trying to find out what makes uh, things engaging and what, what kind of signals from our body um, can we analyze that give us an, an in, um, indication of um, whether or not we're engaged with something. So it ties into this idea of engagement. And um, I also wrote my uh, dissertation on the topic of um, what um, engages people, what is the physiological indicator of fun and engagement in a video game. Um, so we have different measures that we're interested in. One of the first measures is electrodermal activity, and um, you will probably um, get a, a little bit of feedback about this, um, these different measures throughout the day. So I'm just going to give a really brief introduction here of um, what they mean. And then as we see some of the other speakers come in, you'll get more in depth of um, how they're using it within their research. So electrodermal activity is a primary index of arousal. It's usually measured on the hand or on the feet. And it gives us an idea of um, whether or not we're excited about something. So this is excitement can come from an engaging math task. It can come from something like an engaging engaging video game, uh, it can come from sexual stimulation, but it can also come just from working out. Um, so any kind of arousal that we feel is indicated by this. So this is something to keep in mind. Um, arousal can have, um, arousal is arousal and can be excitement, but um, uh, arousal can also have different sources um, that trigger the arousal. The same with facial electromyography. Now, if we have arousal sort of as an intensity of an emotion, if we look at facial electromyography, we're looking at electrodes in the face that give us an idea of what muscular activity in the face is being triggered by an event. So this gives us an idea of uh, either a positive or a negative um, emotion that we're feeling as we're engaging with um, an interactive application or a video game. And uh, the idea behind it is that we really get a, a, a very quantitative uh, a number indicator of um, how we're positively or negatively feeling about whatever is going on on the screen. Um, so the idea behind it is, again, trying to classify it along what we call a valence dimension, so not the intensity that we get with the arousal, but the positivity or negativity of an uh, effect. 
There's also electroencephalography, and electroencephalography is the, the idea of looking at different electrodes on the scalp of the brain. Um, so the idea is we're not looking inside the brain as we do in fMRI and um, as we do in the harder neurological measures, but we're just looking on the outside, we're just on the surface, and we're just looking at electricity that's already there, so there's no electrical stimulation or something that uh, people might think of when they hear, they hear the term electro, right? But it's really just the, the passive electricity that's already there that is um, elicited whenever we're engaging with uh, a task. And so there's different areas that you can look at. Uh, the areas are com corresponding to the lobes of the brain. And there's also different electrodes that you can look at. And the electrodes are essentially um, giving us an, a, a value of the electricity. And this can then be mapped to frequency dimensions. It's usually a rather complex process of how we analyze it. But um, again, the different uh, frequency dimensions that we would map this to would give us an idea of, OK, this is a, a state of sleepiness, or this is a state of alertness. And then we can, can look at whether or not that alert alertness is tied to a certain lobe of the brain. So the idea behind it is that essentially we're getting an overview of what's going on cognitively with the user whenever they're engaging with an activity. There's also this idea, and I just want to put this up as a word of warning whenever we're engaging with psychophysiological measures, uh, there tends to be uh, what we call the early overexcitement. Uh, so whenever you use a psychophysiological measure for the first time and you see your brain waves on a screen, it's, it's a very interesting feeling. You get very excited that all of a sudden you can look inside your body and you know what's going on. And this is really cool, because obviously now we've got it all figured out. We know exactly what's happening to us. But really what it is, it is a signal of something that's happening with our muscles, with our nerve cells, or with our glands, and so we're measuring the activity of that. And so we have to be really careful, how do we map this? Now, if we have something like arousal, it's a really pretty clear one-to-one -one mapping. Okay, we measure arousal, so the, the graph goes up, it means we're aroused, there's something exciting happening, right? This is a, a, like one of the clearest uh, psychophysiological measures. If we go into things like um, EMG activity and um, EEG activity, a lot of the measures require good subjective interpretation, so yes, we can say there has been an activity in this lobe of the brain and um, it's uh, very likely related to us being more alert at that state, but if we don't cross-correlate it with the traditional measures that we know, such as interviews and surveys, um, it's really hard to establish ground, ground truth. So we are still in this phase especially if, if we look at video games. Video games are very complex stimuli. This is uh, not the classic thing you know in psychology where you have an image that looks really gruesome or a sound that's really scary, and that's going to elicit a certain reaction. But no, in, in video games, we've got all the complex stimuli at all times, right? We've got the textures, the 3D models, there's some shooting in the background, it's really exciting. Um, so we really have to be careful on what we're actually measuring and what's eliciting the signal, right? So um, when we're looking at EEG and EMG measures, um, we really want to establish a ground truth of, okay, this signal or this uh, quantitative, uh, this quantification that we have of that signal actually means this or that. So this is really important as we go forward to be aware that we're still in this phase, especially in, in video game research, but also in user experience research with these engagement measures, we're in the stage of establishing that ground truth, which is it's why it's so important to have labs like this that establish this ground truth and help us build these measures. So, um, and this is how that usually looks like in an application. This is um, a very happy participant that actually gets uh, an EEG cap put on. Um, there's measures on his hands. There's also um, heart um, rate activity that's being um, uh, measured as the participant is then engaging with the video game. This is also an old school Toby eye tracker. I know that you guys have the, the more amazing stuff now with the, um, the, the glasses and whatnot, but um, back in the day, we, we actually used like um, uh, really sturdy big eye trackers um, when, when we analyzed the um, interactions with the game. Now, one of the primary um, things that is of interest when we're analyzing video games is, of course, flow. Now, flow is this zone that um, we find ourselves in um, when we feel sufficiently challenged um, while we're actually learning whatever is going on. Now, people in video games are, are kind of uh, probably sick of uh, seeing this flow diagram at this point. Um, I'm pretty sure even if you're in engaging UX, um, you've probably come across this at some point, and if, uh, especially if you study learning, you've, you've probably seen it as well. Now, the idea is, though, and this is quite important that we need to adapt, like our skills need to um, increase as the challenge increases. So there, there can be um, different areas um, where we're not in flow anymore because we feel like there's too much challenge or too much um, uh, or not enough challenge and, and more boredom, right? So the idea behind it is that when we're looking at, and you will see later in some of these studies, when we're looking at things like task load and engagement indices, uh, that it's really important to see um, where do people 
stay engaged, and they usually stay engaged when they're in this flow zone, or they get engaged, and then ideally they achieve flow as a, as a state of more engagement. So with this research, this is sort of the, the, the classic idea of um, what flow is. It's, it means you're concentrated on whatever is, is happening at the, at the current moment, and that your action, your consciousness merge. You're just doing um, a thing that you're really excited about and that you're really um, encapsulated in. And you're not really aware of yourself. You're much more aware of whatever you're identifying with at that point. This can be an office application, or it can be um, the avatar in Assassin's Creed. So it's, it's really um, an identification that happens that is not with ourselves, but with whatever is going on in the game world. And it leads to a little bit of a distorted time perception. Uh, in, in games, we call this the, the, the toilet syndrome, right? Like you play a game, you've played it for four to five hours, and all of a sudden, you know, I really got to go to the toilet, and I've just forgotten about my bodily functions here because I was uh, completely immersed in that game, right? Um, which is, of course, it's, it's funny in a gaming context, but it's actually something as a company that you're looking forward to, getting an employment employee that engaged, that they're not really caring about um, anything else, that they're really focused on the task that's going on there, is actually something that can be beneficial for productivity. Um, so the idea um, essentially now is to try and find a conceptualization of flow that allows us to um, classify it whenever we do analysis with, um, with the flow concept. And the problem was, and, and this is more for the researcher in you, there's several papers that we reviewed and looked at conceptualizations of flow and what they're lacking and how we can try and actually classify it into something that's more tangible as dimensions of flow. And so we came up with these four dimensions saying um, flow really relates to effectance, like we feel like we're changing something, we feel effective, we, we feel like we have power over the game world. Identification where we're identifying with something, not identification with self, but identification with something else. Transportation, which really relates to what we loosely call immersion or presence in, in games, where we feel like we're transported in something that's not here. And then the mental workload idea where we need to find something that sufficiently stimulates our brains that we actually feel engaged with it. Otherwise, flow cannot happen. And so this leads to this idea of this flow model. I made a little fancy graphic here for this, um, that we essentially have these four dimensions that we want to be able to mark up when we're thinking about flow. Transportation, identification, effectance, and mental workload. And interestingly enough, I think in, in, throughout the day, you will see some of these um, dimensions reoccur in the research that the other researchers and uh, presenters here are doing. And a lot of that informs different areas of productivity, engagement, and fun. So a lot of these dimensions reoccur in there. Now, of course, we, we want to do some more hands-on stuff when we engage with um, the games industry and when we actually um, build tools that can be of help to games user researchers, which are uh, researchers that are trying to improve video gaming. And one of the tools that we worked on was called Biometric Storyboards. And um, the idea behind it was that you essentially have a single user experience graph that gives you an overview of what is actually going on in the game world. The interesting thing is that that graph is combined of three separate graphs. One is the designer graph. And this is interesting because the designer can go before they play a game and they can draw an overview, and this is more a plot than uh, an actually storyboard, right? So they can draw an overview of this is where I want my player to be engaged. I want the player to be engaged at this part of the level. And you could do the same thing with, a, with an application or a task as well, saying at this point I want that person to be highly excited. And then we compare this, the designer intention, with what the user's actually doing inside the video game. And so the, there's two things. One is the user feedback, the report. A lot of you are familiar with that. Usually after a user study, we sit down, we ask them, we interview them. But in this case, we also let them draw what they consider is their experience over the game. But then what we also did is we measured their physiological rep responses. And that's what you can see on the top right, where we um, essentially have markers. You have little green and little red markers showing you positive or negative valence at that point. And then you also have indicators where the participant was giving feedback that they had trouble in the game, which is shown by the little participant markers on the bottom. So then the user researcher can use this tool and drill down where there is a good experience or where there's a complicated experience. Usually, um, as user researchers, unfortunately, we're much more interested in when there are problems than when there are things going well, because we want to talk to the design team and help improve those problems and help fix what, what's going on with um, the game, right? 
So we ran a comparison study and looked at different player testing approaches, whether or not you cannot design, um, whether or not you don't use user testing, whether or not you use biometric storyboards or traditional user testing, and it turned out that you could really drill down and, and have a finer granularity of feedback when you're using those biometric storyboards. So it really helps you um, find a better polish for the final product if you use this method. And we kept um, working on um, different um, applications of this method. And one of the recent tools called Rapidly is an online tool uh, to review this experience. Um, the idea is a little similar to what's happening by metric storyboards. We have um, physiological graphs, uh, we have user annotation, we have the video, the review video that shows us what the person was doing at that time. Um, but then people can also, the players can go in and they can just double click and annotate. But while they're doing it, the design team downstairs can also load that same graph because it's online, right? And collaborate with um, the user researcher in the room and get, give feedback, okay, this is something um, that I actually consider important. Can you look at this area? and then the, the user researcher can drill down in that area. Whereas um, the, the players, while they're annotating, um, all of that, um, if you run a multiplayer game, for example, all of that will show up in the same screen for the user researcher. Let's say you run a multiplayer testing on Assassin's Creed, a uh, beautiful game from Ubisoft Montreal, where you want to know what is actually going on with all of the players while they're engaging with um, each other. You could run that with those four people, and then you could, um, the user researcher could get that feedback from all people simul sim simultaneously, and it actually speeds up the analysis process, right? Um, what you can see here is those um, annotation windows where um, people can just select, okay, this is something that I consider uh, a moment of importance for me, and then they can rate it. We've got the little rating system, uh, whether it was neutral, frustrated, or positive, and then they can add a little um, description of what was actually going on. So not only do we get the peaks from the physiological data, but we also get the user annotation, and we also get it in real time in a browser, which is really nice for collaborating in a team. So this is our... Um, and current effort in trying to make this more portable and making the analytics um, much more interesting for people. Um, and finally, I want to talk about uh, a player data visualization approach that we're currently looking at. Obviously, in video games, it's also important where the player is moving spatially in the game so that we can then try to find problem areas, choke points, and other things in the video game world that, are, uh, that, that we want to help improve as designers. Um, so, Within this visualization, what we did is essentially we tracked the movement of a couple of players through the game world. And this is a very simple game world, a 2D, a 2D um, Mario game, right? Um, but what we could see is where people were um, having trouble within the game. And this is not just seen by repetitions of movement, but also by the color coding of the line, uh, which was mapped to a galvanic skin response. Now, if you remember, galvanic skin response, or electrodermal activity, EDA, as I called it at the start, is what relates to player arousal. So it relates to whenever we get excited. So these are moments where we feel really strongly about something that's happening in the game. And as you can see in the area um, B there, um, and in area C as well with that big final jump, uh, people have higher arousal. Now, again, keep in mind, this is a really good first step because it visualizes and shows us areas of this high excitement. We still have to do the legwork as user researchers and go in and actually ask, so what was going on? You know, in the C area, is he just excited because there's a big jump that's being made? Um, is this actually an, a level design issue or is this a, a good issue in terms of the excitement? So this is where the annotations come in. You can see there's a little purple bubble there. And again, in this visualization, the player was able to review their progress without seeing everyone's progress but their own progress and then annotate their own line and say, at this point, I felt this or that. And the user researcher could then, of course, also drill down with the player asking, oh, so what is your opinion about this? So it gives you a much better initial overview. It's a really nice thing to present to your team and say, this is, we've evaluated the level with 15 people. This is what we saw. Uh, we ran the interviews, and this was backed up. So now we have evidence. We bring that to the manager and say, you know what? This really needs improvement at this, this, and that point. Um, so it really helps you justifying your user research um, items on the agenda. So I want to leave you with some developer guidelines um, as we've uh, looked into uh, some of these tools, and um, I consider some of them highly um, useful to anyone wanting to work in, in engaging user experiences. So first of all, when we use the visual experience representations, um, this is something that we want to do at all times whenever possible, but as something that we do at the start, right? It's something that gives us the initial overview that allows us to build our argument as user research about what needs to be improved about the product. 
The second one is that we want to give the players, or in, in uh, the case of a regular application, the users, the opportunity to annotate their own experience, right? As nice as it is to have an interview, it's much more structured if you already have the overview, the graph of the experience, and people are able to just click on the, the different parts of that experience and annotate that. Whether it's physiological or drawn, whatever you have, it's always good to have that annotation in there. The third part is that we want to set an individual threshold marker to help us track whether or not they have an emotional moment. Now, we usually take the experience, so when we look at the physiological experience, we take the mean plus a standard deviation to sort of have a threshold within which we consider uh, some quantitative value to actually be significant or something that we should look into. Otherwise, we're likely just having a regular variation, but we really just want to look at peak points, so points that are of higher interest. So we do the post hoc analysis with the uh, physiological data that we have, and we have the threshold markers that say only if you pass that threshold, we'll track this as an emotional moment moment. The fourth step is that you want to tie player performance, um, especially the spatial player performance, <clears throat> together to help um, the designers improve their locations of the game world. So oftentimes, games are tied to um, virtual locations, so you want to help people cluster those locations. Let's say we're analyzing a quiz game. You kind of have the same thing. It's a, a different semantic, because then the location just becomes the sequence at which you are at within the quiz, right? So um, location, in this case, um, refers to the virtual location, um, the location, the progress that you're in within the game world. Um, the uh, final four guidelines are when you're researching game flow, you should try and to, uh, to simplify the dimensions so that you can facilitate experience coding, right? The whole idea of trying to break flow down into those four dimensions is for us to be able to handle this really, really fuzzy and complicated concept much better and allow us to annotate and code it. So you would then be able to go through the data, color code each of those four dimensions, saying, okay, this is clearly mental workload, this is clearly transportation right here, and you can really say, okay, this is where these um, areas of flow happen. Is it still flow or is it a partial concept? So it helps you improve the overall understanding of are participants sufficiently engaged with the tool at hand. You want to build tools that provide quick and actionable insights. Um, this is, of course, true for anything that you do in industry. Oftentimes, you don't have the turnaround phases that we have as uh, scientists and researchers, right? Like, we wait years for a journal article to get published. Like, seriously, who's got that time in industry, right? The, the guy, like, your boss wants results tomorrow or next week, right? So the important thing is you want to have something that's quick and that's actionable and that you can take back to the team in a rapid, iterative fashion. So you really want to um, try to not to overemphasize theory at this point, but to say, okay, this this is something that I can work with, and this is something that can actually help me improve the game or the product that I'm working on right now. So again, when you do physiological research, this is sort of the um, trade-off that you have to make at that point. So you also want to allow user researchers to drill down deep into your data at any points of particular interest. Now, in the tool that I showed you, it's actually containing all of the initial sampling rate and the initial data and allows you to drill down really deeply into each of these um, bits and pieces that you find interesting, right? So it remains that granularity. And finally, of course, this is why we have an online tool. You want to facilitate inter-developer collaboration, especially between the games user research and the game design teams. This is true for any company. So if you have a user research and you have a design team, they need to be talking to each other. They're usually at war with each other. You've might, you might have seen this. Designers have an idea of how the product should look like, and user research is saying, this is not how it should look like. But to facilitate that collaboration, online tools really help you get your word across and make a good argument for how the design can improve, and ultimately coming up with a better product, which is really what we're all here for. So thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure talking to you. So we have time for a few questions to uh, Leonard. Uh, there's a mic over there, over there. So uh, if uh, one of you uh, could eventually uh, go to the mic and... Any questions? Breaking the ice is always the <laughs> most difficult. We have one over here. Thank you for your presentation, Leonard. Can you talk to us a little bit more about your the rapidly uh, interface? Is it like out there? It's in your lab, or yeah. So it's. Uh... Right now, it's, it was a bachelor thesis of a student uh, that's currently starting his master's um, at our group. And so we are hoping that it will be 
a freely available tool. As researchers, we really don't care about making money that much. Um, but that being said, um, I actually like the entrepreneurial spirit. And if this turns out to be really useful, uh, who knows what this could be at some point. So um, I, I really want to test it and see whether it's actually useful to people first. And then if that turns out to be a good thing, um, maybe it does have a future in, outside of academia. An earlier question from here. Hey, uh, I want to know how the context of the high-tech lab influenced the people that is testing the product or the game or, I don't know, the application. Yeah, context is extremely important, right? Like, context is one of the key dimensions of user experience that we should never forget, which is why a lot of these studies are really hard to do in the field um, in, a, in a regular environment. So for physiological measures, um, really what we are at right now is that we always want to do it in a lab. We always want to do it in a very controlled environment. Not to say that it shouldn't be ecologically valid, because it often is. You have a couch and you make it really comfortable, but you still wanna, want it to be in a lab so that you can reduce, reduce other things that can influence the physiological sensors, such as um, if you have lights that are too bright, that are too close, you're already picking up that noise with your physiological sig signals, right? So you, like, the better you shield off your signals, the better the signal that you get. Plus um, other things such as uh, contextual influences on the experience. Um, so let's say you're wanting to test a mobile game, the, the best way to test a mobile game is still in the lab and actually to script for the contextual experiences that you would have with the physiological measures. Which is again why I'm saying it's not the, the silver bullet that can do everything, but it can help you facilitate, get additional evidence for some of these studies that you would just do in the field otherwise, right? So I think it's very complementary to, especially if we look at mobile UX testing, to some of those studies. Question over here. Yeah, can you tell us, uh, because as an HEI practitioner, I'm, I'm interested in knowing what big game studios are doing UX research like that. Like, do you know what are the practices in the field? Yeah. Um, so I actually presented some of this at the Games User Research Conference in, in Europe uh, this year. And uh, I know for, for sure that Ubisoft in Montreal is uh, involved with these measures. Um, there are any larger... Um, Game Studio these days has a Game Studio the research department, Activision Blizzard. Um, Ubisoft, I think, has the largest across the world because they have several locations of, of Game Studio the researchers. Electronic Arts has a huge department in Vancouver where they're working on this. Um, a lot of uh, smaller indie studios. So there's an incubator in Montreal. Um, escapes me right now the name of it. For indie game developers. Um, it really, name escapes me, but they do games user research as well, testing for, for indie developers as well. So um, right now, the idea is essentially that it's not just the big studios that can build their own team, but there's also, um, uh, there are also third-party studios that are doing games user research for smaller indie type uh, mid-sized uh, gaming companies as well. And, and also, uh, I mean, researchers, for example, we, we do the same with companies like IBLM, for example, yep. is doing that in Montreal. Uh, last question from here. How does the uh, player visualization data impact the way the next game are designed? Sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, sorry. How does the player, player visualization, visualization data impact how the game are designed? Let's say you take Mario Bros, uh, and you see that players at really difficult, difficult time at a certain time in the, in the game. Yeah. How, does, how, would that, like, how does that impact the way the, like Mario Bros 2 would be designed or Mario Bros 3? Yeah, so again, this ties into this idea that in the end, the game user researcher still has to make a judgment call and still has to make a decision. This is just an aid for them to get to that decision, right? So at the end, there still needs to be a design suggestion that comes out of this saying, okay, so based on the, the best guess that I have, based on this evidence on this data, I would either you know, in, increase the width here so to make it more exciting. Um, he could also say, okay, I want to do a and B testing, so I want to now test a version of this level that has um, X amount of pixels width for the gap that needs to be jumped over, and another one that has a smaller width for the gap that needs to be jumped over. Looks at the graph again, says, okay, this is more exciting, there's less failures actually here, um, so maybe this is what we want to go with at this point in the game. So it, it gives you an idea of the elements that you have in the game, in, in, in this very easy jumping game, it's usually whether or not you have collectibles or the, the, the width uh, within which you jump over the gaps, and the amount of enemies that are being delivered at any phase in the game that you want to con have a control over. So you're influencing the game mechanics in this case, um, variables of game design as you're um, looking at some of the results of the experiences of the player. But in the end, yes, it's a, it's a dialogue that happens between the user researcher and the game designer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent presentation.